objectives of the volunteer program is to establish and maintain a coordination and collaborative systems for volunteers in the field of risk, man risk management in Jamaica, primarily through community disaster risk management groups and teams who are organized to address disaster risk management actions at the parish level. And this becomes vital in every time that we are facing a crisis, especially disasters and major emergencies. The Projects for the Improvement of Emergency Communication Systems is a collaboration between the Government of Jamaica and the Government of Japan and aim to improve the emergency communication infrastructure through the installation of wireless communication systems and relevant equipment, which allow for swift and robust communication between government agencies and the communities in times of disaster and emergencies. And communication is critical whenever time there is any form of disasters, whether it's a public health crisis, such as COVID-19 or hurricanes or any form of disaster and emergencies. In relation to the 2020 hurricane season amidst COVID-19, extreme weather condition can impose significant impacts on the social and socioeconomic conditions of our country. The impact of disasters on Jamaica have had significant um, impacts in terms of infrastructure and economic losses, and Prime Minister did speak to that earlier in his, in his charge to us. Prepar preparing for the hurricane season is an annual routine effort, but with the advent of coronavirus, COVID-19, preparation this season has taken on added significance. The protocol for the season will include a measures around mitigation, preparedness, and response amidst COVID-19. Some critical areas are shelter management, and Prime Minister did speak extensively to that, Testi testing the national response coordination systems for multiple disasters, which is a possibility that that can happen this season, given that we are in the midst of COVID-19 and we are entering the hurricane season. Um, looking at specially tailored public information, pre 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 preparedness for vulnerable population, and multiple recovery planning process. The recovery process will also include initial damage assessment around geospatial technology. And ge geospatial technology has been, using, has been used extensively during our COVID-19 response. In closing, Recognizing that the country is in the middle of a pandemic response, the ODPEM stands ready to prepare the country for any eventuality that may face us during the upcoming hurricane season. The agency will continue to lead the process of preparing Jamaica and will continue to do, do, do this through enhanced partnerships with agencies of government, the private sector, NGOs, and our communities, all working together to build a culture of preparedness remembering that disaster happened, be prepared. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, the Acting Director General of ODPEM, Richard Thompson. Ahead of Evan Thompson, the Director at the National Meteorological Service, who is making his way up to the lectern uh, to give his presentation, I just want to alert everyone, both on the Zoom call and certainly here, that we also have with us the Honorable Desmond McKenzie, the Minister of Local Government, who spoke already, the Honorable Dr. Horace Chang, Minister of National Security, who just joined us, Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton, the Minister of Health, and P.S. Collett Risden Roberts from the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. Also on the Zoom is Minister Chuck, the Minister of Justice, Minister Floyd Green, the Minister of State, uh, in agriculture and fisheries, along with his permanent secretary, the permanent secretary at the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of Local Government, and the Ministry of National Security. And we also have partners from the telecom sector, from National Works Agency, who are here as well, and the National Water Commission, along with Fire Brigade and several others uh, who are part of the Disaster Risk Management Council. May I now invite Mr. Thompson to give his presentation. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, Chairman of the National Disaster Risk Management Council, Prime Minister Holness, um, Deputy Chairman, Minister McKenzie, other members of the cabinet, I see my former um, minister, Dr. Chang here, uh, 
also permanent secretaries and other chairs of committees of council, other members of council, all persons present, all media who are present even um, via the Zoom link, a very good morning to all. The hurricane season, by all events and purposes, has already begun. <laughs> we have already started to see activity from the 2020 hurricane season, albeit that the official start of the season is the first day of June, and the season continues for six months until the 30th day of November. We have already seen Tropical Storm Arthur develop starting on May 15, and now on May 26, we have seen Tropical Storm Bertha also developing in close proximity in terms of the area in which the development has taken place. I have prepared some slides here so we could move through our slides. Our, um, the second system has developed, and if we take a look at the past few years, we'll recognize that this is no longer an unusual occurrence. Because over the past six years, we've had tropical cyclones develop ahead of the hurricane season. In May, in some instances in April, in one instance in January, and this has been happening since 2015. Even before then, on occasion, we would have had a system developed before the June 1 start of the hurricane season, but it is becoming more and more frequent and more and more normal for this kind of development to take place, and it's, it, it begs us to consider whether climate change is really taking root in the region and causing these kinds of changes to take place. We're also seeing more intense systems develop, and so we have to be monitoring. If we take a look at the preseason named storms, we'll see that we had one, a few of them developing to the eastern part of the United States, as we had with Anna in 2015, and we are now seeing with Bertha and, and Arthur. In 2016, Alex developed all the way out in the eastern, in the eastern Atlantic Ocean, way back, way early in January. Arlene, in 2017, developed also in the North Atlantic, but well north of the tropical areas. It was not a tropical cyclone, but it was a named storm for the season. We had Alberto, in 2018, develop. And this occurred in the Western Caribbean. In 2019, Andrea developed also in the North Atlantic. So we see that there is no set area in which we should expect this kind of development to take place. It could happen anywhere before the season actually officially begins. The forecast, we would have heard Prime Minister Holness mention a moment ago what the, the, the official forecast is for the hurricane season, with anywhere between 13 and 19 tropical storms, or named storms developing. We also see where we could have anywhere between six and 10 hurricanes and between three and six of them becoming major hurricanes. The probabilities would suggest that there is, there is a 60% chance that this season will be an above normal season. There is a 30% chance that it will be a normal season and only 10% likelihood that we will have a season that is below normal levels of activity. And this, there is a 70% confidence in this forecast based on how situations have been developing, how climatic conditions have been developing over the waters. So we are pretty well assured that it will be an active season. Whether or not it will be an active season in relation to Jamaica's experience is yet to be seen. But if we take a look at a comparison of this year's forecast, with last year's occurrence, with the normal occurrence, we will see some things here. We'll see that we are following a trend that began in 1995 with very active hurricane seasons. This trend is continuing. At best, 
this year's season based on the forecast of 13 to, to 19 tropical storms. At best, it looks like an average year, at best. But at worst, we could see a season that is 60% more active than normal. Very likely, because just last year, we had 18 named storms, and this year, the maximum expected would be 19. We see a year forecast that is slightly more active than the 2019 season, where we had those 18 systems. We had six hurricanes, and we had three major hurricanes following a normal season. But going forward into how the Met Service is prepared for this, we have become kind of accustomed <laughs> to this kind of activity and monitoring the oceans, monitoring the waters over and around Jamaica to see where developments are taking place. And this is not an activity that only takes place during the months of the hurricane season. One representative in the media re recently made a comment to me and said, this is your time of the year. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is not the only time of the year that the Meteorological Service and the forecasters of the Meteorological Service are monitoring actively the waters surrounding our country and the wider region. The monitoring continues, and I must indicate that we have adequate equipment up-to-date equipment. We are not lagging behind the rest of the world. We have the reception of the kind of satellite imagery, the connections with the various agencies and the other meteorological services, the data banks and the coordination centers. We have access to all these. And so we are pretty much kept up-to-date with what is happening globally. There is direct communication with the National Hurricane Center, and I mention that because the National Hurricane Center of the National Oceanic and Atmo Atmospheric Administration in the United States operates as the regional specialized meteorological center for the Caribbean region. And so they are responsible for monitoring and for sharing information with us as we go forward. Where staffing is concerned, the Met Service is also in a good position having adequate staff to cover. Actually, we have our full cadre of professional staff. We, ha we are in the process of revising our, our severe weather orders, which would be the guide for our operations during the hurricane season in particular, but also the guide to our operations during any severe weather activity. So we are in the process now of revising that, something that we do every year just before the hurricane season, or a hurricane or annual hurricane season meeting actually will be held tomorrow. So this meeting has preempted. So I can't tell you the, the latest in terms of our preparedness. But we have our full cadre, decades of professional experience and training in hurricane forecasting for the majority of our forecasting staff. Also, where equipment is concerned, our communications is up to par. We are en enabled through our closed user group of mobile cell phones, radio communication with the Emergency Operations Center and the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, our interaction in, with our website and the social media, our CAP-enabled alerting platform, Smart Alert, that is available on mobile devices as well, and our public 116 hotline that we all must become familiar with that gives the latest update on hurricane activity. And finally, in terms of our um, administration and the access to mobility that is also available to the Met Service in our own fleet of vehicles as well as the assistance of our Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. So you have our full support, but we also require the full support of all citizens of Jamaica to make this a good partnership where we listen to the messages, the warning messages, and we take heed to the messages as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Evan Thompson. He's the director of the National Meteorological Service, giving a presentation to the council. Uh, next, we'll have Mr. Varden Downer representing the National Works Agency. As Mr. Downer makes his way, we have an apology here from the Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport, the Honorable Olivia Grange, who was not able to join us. And in keeping with the Prime Minister's thrust to ensure that we have partnership of all stakeholders, along with those who I'd mentioned earlier, we also do have on the Zoom call from the opposition, Mr. Julian Robinson, and joining us here physically, Mrs. Natalie Nita Headley. And so, Mr. Downer, it's over to you. 
Most Honorable Prime Minister, Ministers, Government, uh, Opposition Spokesperson and Local Government, Mrs. Natalie Nita, Permanent Secretaries, Colleagues, good afternoon everyone. The National Works Agency, as a member of the National, <coughs> excuse me, National Disaster Council has the responsibility during an emergency to ensure that access is provided for all roads across the island. We also provide support uh, to the National Emergency Center in the ensuring that information is, is disseminated in a timely manner. We also provide critical safeguard for vital assets and we monitor flood control systems nationally. The vulnerability of, <coughs> excuse me, of our infrastructure is well known. In recent years, the increase in frequency of rainfall has been observed across the world. And of course, this has had deleterious impact on our infrastructure. Some of the areas of vulnerability for the NWA to focus on includes flooding, landslides, and of course, road river interactions. 15% of our main road network is actually prone to flooding. 7% of our main road network is prone to landslide and 20% of our bridges are situated in flood prone areas. The impact of climate change on our network, as I mentioned earlier, um, causes the NWA to examine the hazards that we have to treat with and these include we having more hot days, greater wind speeds, more frequent intense precipitation and increased coastal storm intensity and also sea level rise. What does this mean for the impact on our network? Pavement failure, landslides, breakaways, flooding, coastal erosion. We therefore have the responsibility of employing what we call adapt adaptation strategies, which includes utilizing better pavement material to ensure that the pavement can, be, can sustain these effects increase routine maintenance of our main road network, improve our drainage systems and capacity, and employ more rigorous design specifications. We also have to look at relocating coastal roads where possible or build the roads higher to deal with the effects of flooding. During 2019 to 2020, part of our effort in preparing for this year's Atlantic hurricane season, as we know, when we speak of the year, we speak of the financial year, which just ended in April, in, in March. We employ programs for mitigation works, which includes addressing critical drains, tributaries, community drains, major gullies, and um, river channels. We undertook works to the tune of almost a billion Jamaican dollars, addressing critical drains island-wide. Our objective is to build resilient infrastructure which includes bridge construction, drainage improvement, retaining walls, and river training works. We also have, having just completed um, part of our drainage improvement by building some of the infrastructure that will in fact be considered all weather infrastructure. I'm referring here to the Marcos Gave Drive Road Improvement Project, the Mandela Highway Road Improvement Project, just to name a few, Hagley Park Road Improvement Project, and Constant Spring Road Improvement Project. Our business plan for 2020-2021 as part of the mitigation strategy includes targeting once again our critical drains, tributary and community drains. Ladies and gentlemen, we carry out our drain cleaning program on a cyclical basis where we do drain cleaning in May, June. At this point in time, we are embarking on our first drain cleaning program for the financial year. The second one will be done during the summer and the third one is usually at the end of the hurricane season, which is November, December. And as you can see there, we also have plans for some river training. This year, in light of the budget support that we receive, we will be carrying out at least $354 million worth of work. Part of our business plan as well in upgrading our infrastructure, because we do routine maintenance, as I said, and we also upgrade our infrastructure, includes the Southern Coastal Highway Improvement Project, which we have started, and our responsibility is to deal with the eastern leg of it, which is between Harbourview to Yalas and Yalas to Port Antonio. 
we'll be looking at putting down four-lane roadway as well as two-lane roadway from Yalas to Port Antonio, and the four-lane goes between Harborview to Yalas. All of this is part of building a resilient infrastructure network that can withstand the effects of climate change. Of course, as you can see there as well, we are trying to complete at this point in time our Kingston Junction Road is between Broadgate and Agualtaville. This certainly will reduce the effects of landslides and land slippage that we have to contend with through that corridor. It's going to skip through these pretty quickly. Part of our disaster management strategy, there are five areas that we focus on. One is preparedness strategy. The other one is response strategy. The third is our recovery strategy. And the fourth is development strategies, a long-term basis. And the fifth one, of course, is our mitigation strategy. And hastening along, um, the National Works Agency has undertook what we call hazard mapping of our flood-prone areas. And as you may be aware, that approximately half of the population actually lives in what is deemed flood-prone areas, which are along our coastline, which is where the towns of most of our parishes are situated. Our future plans is to focus on areas such as, as part of building the resilience of the network, a Nata Bay to Buff Bay shoreline protection works, North Gully Improvement Project, and the Falmouth Drag Line, which is an area we know is, to pr is prone to flooding. The NWA also um, have commenced work on building what we call a public safety network, which will connect the JDF, the JCF, fire stations, ADPEM, our own offices, NWA, hospitals, and other government offices. And of course, we are creating a high-speed broadband communication network for our intelligent transport system. The aim is to eventually establish a public safety network linking together systems for traffic management, crime management, and emergency management as we partner with our various government agencies. In concluding, Infrastructure is fundamental. Without the necessary infrastructure, economic growth cannot be realized. Our philosophy, therefore, is to ensure that the nation's road transportation infrastructure is appropriately maintained and made more resilient. Climate change requires us to take adaptive measures now and to save lives. And of course, we are continuously learning. As Evan said earlier, every year the situation changes and we have to treat with it. Sometimes it begins in June, sometimes perhaps earlier. So our disaster management is a learning exercise for us. The National Works Agency, Prime Minister, is ready and we are prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Downer. The preparedness of the National Works Agency crucial as we uh, seek to meet the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. We'll now have a presentation from the Jamaica Fire Brigade. Commissioner Stuart Beckford is with us. Uh, Commissioner Beckford is really our, I beg your pardon, our fourth presenter. We have two more presentations to go. And of course, then we'll have a five minute question and answer section uh, where we'll be able to engage those on the Zoom call who may be able to make an input. And so let's hear then from Commissioner Stuart Beckford. Honorable Prime Minister, and your own list, Minister of Government present and those on Zoom, heads up agencies, permanent secretaries, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Jamaica Fire Brigade's primary role in the event of an hurricane is rescue and fire management. And this role has taken on added significance because of the complexity of conducting response and recovery operations while taking preventative measures to protect the health and safety of our fire personnel and disaster survivors during the outbreak of a pandemic. It's against this background that we would have reviewed and adjusted our existing plans to include our continuity of operation plan to account for the realities and risk of COVID-19. We are prepared to lead a scalable and flexible response operation, taking into account guidelines issued by the Ministry of Health and Wellness 
and of course, the disaster, Office of the Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management. We have been actively monitoring the availability of all internal resources to support national urban search and rescue teams and other emergency activities. We are conducting contingency planning for both traditional and non-traditional models to meet potential operational needs. In the Jamaica Fire Brigade, there are established operating procedures which can be temporarily expanded to enable greater operational capacity if the country is indeed impacted by a hurricane or storm during, a, during the COVID pandemic. We are aware that we will be required to deploy personnel to disaster impacted areas that may be experiencing outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. And in such instances, we will evaluate the risk and determine the most appropriate approach to take while giving consideration to the guidance and direction of the health officials. We have been reviewing our response plans and standard operating procedures to align, link, and synchronize our response actions with the guidelines issued by ADPEM and, of course, the Ministry of Health. We are putting in place strategies for a variety of potential conditions to account for any possible outbreaks of the COVID-19 virus in communities across the country. We have in place plans to respond in the event we have a reduction in our staffing levels due to the COVID-19 virus. And to this end, we would have updated our co-op plan to reflect the possibility of putting in place measures to continue essential functions and tasks, even at a reduced level. We have been assessing communities' demographics and identifying areas facing high risk, taking into account those communities that may be under stay-at-home orders. The Jamaica Fire Brigade will continue to coordinate closely with the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management and other critical stakeholders, such as the Ministry of Health and Wellness, as we seek to the best available health information to guide our actions during and after a hurricane. Essentially, ladies and gentlemen, the, gentlemen, the Jamaica Fire Brigade primary roles and responsibility includes fire management, search and rescue, to include urban search and rescue, water rescue, vehicle extrication, and collapse structure rescue. We are also responsible for rendering pre-hospital emergency care. We are also tasked with the responsibility of assisting with the transportation of members of the public to medical facilities or shelters. The fire brigade will also assist with the clearing of roadways as well as assist with the recovery process after any disaster. And in order for us to effectively carry out these role and functions, we would have focused on addressing certain issues surrounding our staff complements, as well as training, the availability of specialized equipment, and so forth. As we speak, the Jamaica Fire Brigade has a total staff complement of approximately 2,000 205 members of staff. Of this amount, 1,867 are firefighters who are deployed across 34 stations on the Highland. Training is a priority for us, and as such, we would have conducted a number of training sessions covering certain areas to include water rescue, structural collapse rescue, urban search and rescue, and mass casualty. Jamaica Fire Brigade has a fleet of 88 emergency vehicles to include pumpers, command vehicles, appliance, ambulances, and fire firefighting vessels. These are equipped with small gears and other items of equipment and are deployed across the 13 divisions in the Jamaica Fire Brigade. All fire stations are equipped with at least one fully functioning fire unit. These fire units are equipped with chainsaw, inflatable rafts, which would become handy in conducting water rescue, flotation devices, hydraulic tools, submersible pumps, generators, and folding cots. Jamaica Fire Brigade also operates an emergency medical services, and currently this service is available um, at seven sites across the country, mostly in the western end of the island. 
there are approximately 140 emergency medical technicians equipped to render pre-hospital emergency medical care. These EMTs are supported by a fleet of nine ambulances strategically located across the island. All EMS sites are equipped with relevant protective, personal protective equipment to include goggles, face masks, gloves, and protective gowns. Additionally, all firefighters are trained as first responders. There's no doubt that the advent of COVID, ladies and gentlemen, would have impacted our operational planning environment. And as such, we would have taken proactive steps to ensure that we meet the guidelines as set out by the Ministry of Health as it relates to the health and safety of our emergency responders. In closing, I would like to thank the, the ADPEM and other critical agencies who have been lending support to the Jamaica Fire Brigade as we prepare for what is being predicted to be an active hurricane season. I thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Stuart Beckford of the Jamaica Fire Brigade, giving a comprehensive overview of the state of readiness of our fire services and certainly how they'll play a part in the hurricane season. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the lone female uh, on the uh, list of presenters, the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Local, I beg your pardon, the Ministry of Labor and Social Security, Mrs. Collett Robert Risden, who will speak on matters pertaining to the readiness of the ministry uh, for the hurricane season. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge the Prime Minister and Chairman of the National Disaster Risk Management Council, Honorable Andrew Holness, Deputy Chairman, Minister McKenzie, other ministers here, and joining us via Zoom, um, other permanent secretaries, members of the council and media. The Ministry of Labor and Social Security, as chair of the Humanitarian Assistance Committee, is the lead agency as it relates to the welfare support provided during an event. Consequent, um, of course, recently, our, our response mechanism has been heightened and activated due to COVID-19. Our humanitarian assistance response utilizes a multi-sectoral approach. The focal point for the packaging and distribution of supplies is usually from the ministry's warehouse, warehouse on, um, and we do this through a collaborative effort with Red Cross, Food for the Poor, ADRA, Salvation Army, JCF, and JDF. And Prime Minister and members, I want to specially acknowledge the contribution of Food for the Poor and Red Cross and ADRA, especially in our ongoing response due to COVID-19. Um, and we know going forward, we will continue to have their support. The humanitarian assistance response team within the ministry comprises of over 300 frontline staff island-wide and our response in the event of an, an, an event is usually supported by other ministries, departments, and agencies, and in particular local government, SDC, um, and the other officers. We also work through a large team of volunteers, over 200 volunteers registered. Our staff have been trained and are ready to respond. Staff members, certainly within the MLSS, and we do have supplies of gears within the ministry um, or warehouse of PPEs. We're in the process of securing additional, we have PPEs for COVID-19, and we're in the process of securing additional supplies for PPEs as it relates to a disaster, um, a hurricane, such as rain cloaks, water boots, and so forth. We do have a supply on hand, but I will be um, the first to admit that we, our supplies need to be beefed up. Our social workers have been trained in, psycho, in providing psychosocial psycho, support, first aid, and CPR across the parishes. 
the allocation or allocation of disaster supplies. Usually at this time in the year is usually when we are procuring and pre-positioning supplies, especially as it relates to food, because um, we know that that is a primary and critical um, response of ours. However, due to COVID-19, as I said, our supplies have been depleted. However, we have established various arrangements with a number of our suppliers to take supplies on demand. Notwithstanding that, our lines of credits are in place in all of our parishes for um, initial emergency response. A humanitarian act assistance action plan and escalated response mechanism was developed and thankfully we didn't have to roll it out too much so far for COVID-19. Some aspects of it was rolled out, but the plan, the escalated plan is relevant for a an, an national hazard. That plan entails alternative packaging and distribution sites for for support across the island. And we have established a number of sites in all of our 14 parish of 14 parishes to be able to store and distribute um, certainly welfare items from. Those sites were identified um, in support from Food for the Poor, some of them are Food for the Poor, some are ADRA locations, and some are also Red Cross locations. All, all of our parish offices and staff are in a response mode due to the protracted COVID-19 response. Both the National Humanitarian Assistance Committee and the Parish Health, Welfare, and Public Education Committees have been activated and have been meeting on a regular basis. And this is because of COVID, we started early, but it has set the stage for us to lead into the season to come, which I hope um, Prime Minister, the prayers will be answered. The MLSS, as I said, we have entered into various framework agreements two framework agreements, one primarily for the supply of food and another for the supply of bedding. We are in the process to procure other items for our stores and we are in the process of working with Red Cross for the training of shelter managers. Due to COVID-19 that was scaled back but we recognize we have to ramp that back up at this time. At that at this juncture, I would stop but just to say that we look forward to receiving additional support, um, certainly from the Minister of Finance to beef up our warehouse. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, P.S. Risen, uh, for your presentation this afternoon. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're doing very well with time, too. It's just been a, an hour and five minutes that we've been at this meeting, we have our final presentation, the Minister of Health and Wellness, the Honorable Dr. Christopher Tufton, who will speak. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, Honorable Prime Minister, colleague ministers live in the audience, Ministers McKenzie and Chang, and other ministers on the Zoom screen. I think I said Minister Fable Williams um, uh, member Natalie Nita Headley, representing the opposition, and I understand Julian Robinson is on line. All other agencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good, good afternoon to you all. All right, so I'm going to be very, very brief, and there's a, there's a, a, a PowerPoint presentation on the screen, Public Health in a New Normal. Uh, let me just begin, however, by saying that the Ministry of Health and Wellness is committed to working with my colleague, Minister Mackenzie in particular, but all the other ministers, ministries and agencies, and of course, under the able leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister, Andrew Holness. So from a health perspective, as you know, this year has been quite an exciting year for us for more reasons than one. 
but COVID has really dominated the space and the national discussion. And so the, the key focus there has been on how we have prepared prior to COVID, what we have done since COVID, and where we're headed in terms of this particular season, both from a COVID perspective, but generally also from the hurricane season perspective. So in terms of the interpandemic phase, uh, this of course explains the phase between two pandemics, the last one being the H1N1 era, 2008-2009, uh, 20, and there are a number of things that were done since then, having learned many lessons from that period. So the, what did we intend to achieve? Preparation of all sectors of the society for a response, response uh, a strengthened response to the pandemic, a pandemic threat. Uh, so we had a pandemic plan that was developed. We branded now the COVID plan, but it actually started as a result of H1N1. A disaster risk management apparatus mobilized clinical and primary healthcare system assessed and strengthened for response and the public education program. Uh, the alert phase, uh, which has taken place up to this point, even though I think we're somewhere between alert and epidemic phase, we're in, we're in the pandemic phase. Um, the alert phase really tried to achieve a delay in the disease crossing our borders coming into Jamaica and there are a number of actions that were taken to support that. Restrictions, as you know, on travel, uh, quarantine, isolation, protocols, and then having had the first um, case of COVID-19 identified within a particular period. So we did achieve some, some amount of delay. And then the uh, epidemic phase, managing and controlling the spread and impact of the, of the disease. And generally speaking, I think we have done well and what we have sought to do is to institutionalize those arrangements, if you will, the structure, which we will transfer and use as needs be for the hurricane season. So after 78 days, nine deaths, which is a 1.6 mortality rate with the global rate being over six, 6.4. Uh, the recovery rate, 47%, hospitalization, 1.4%, which is well below what entails globally, and, and we could go on. In terms of the recovery phase, the strategic objective is to build back better, strong, and more resilient. So we learn as we go along, uh, and we move on from there. I think we have gone through some of those particular initiatives to support that. Preparation for the hurricane season 2020, uh, the areas of focus, next slide please, would be the gap analysis for primary healthcare facilities, an analysis for secondary facilities, uh, the public health risk communication strategy which is being developed, uh, procurement needs and restocking of emergency supplies which is on the way, looking at what we would need in case of, an, uh, of a hurricane related emergency, assessment of shelters across the country which is now taking place, and disaster response plans reviewed and updated for all health facilities um, within the public health infrastructure across the country, both hospitals and, and of course health centers. So all of this represents the, the sort of overarching approach that we will take in preparation for the season. The next slide looks at the direction and coordination activities. Um, our emergency operating center continues to be coordinated through the emergency disaster management and special services branch. So we work, of course, very closely with Minister McKenzie, who has the emergency operating center, um, the emergency disaster management apparatus within his, his, his ministry. We have set up a new um, emergency operating center, which is very technology driven at the IBM building in New Kingston that was opened about two months, six weeks to two months ago. And it's, it's, it's very able to respond and to coordinate from that location across the country. Emergency management training on mass casualty, damage loss assessment, and other critical life-saving um, 
activities have been triggered. The smart, SMART hospital program has been ongoing, and that looks at, among other things, how we ensure that that infrastructure is in place and can withstand hurricane conditions so that after the event we can cope with dealing with the cleanup and the response. Uh, we can't afford to be down after a hurricane because clearly we are critical to saving lives. And then the environmental health interventions are ongoing to monitoring the health program throughout the country. Um, almost completed, where are we now? Hurricane preparedness plans have been drafted by all facilities and are to be submitted to the Health Emergency Operating Center for finalization. So those plans are being done now by the regional health authorities. Costing of gaps and procurement plan being finalized for procurement action by the authorities also. Emergency supply for critical drugs is now uh, ongoing and, and, and some of that has taken place already in terms of procurement. The operating center is in full swing given the COVID response and therefore it is up and running and able to adjust accordingly depending on the, the, any impossible hurricane related emergency. And review and restructure of the emergency disaster management and special services branch of the ministry to increase capacity to respond to multiple interventions. This year, uh, frankly speaking, will Let's hope that um, the projections of an active season does not materialize. But assuming that it does, uh, between hurricane and the projections of an active dengue season and COVID, um, Prime Minister, you know, <laughs> we may be in for a, a very exciting period. And of course, the government's obligation is to secure the population. So health will probably continue to be the flavor of the month, if you will, to use a parochial term, because of all of the other things that are likely to happen um, over the next number of months. And finally, next steps, participate in all national hurricane preparedness actions. We are available and will continue to do so. Finalize the procurement of stock, monitor and manage all the stock levels uh, to ensure we are not out of stock and in terms of being a critical part of the parish, regional, and national levels for health, that is a part of the plan that is on, we are working on now. And uh, you would have heard that we had announced, with the support of the Ministry of Finance, an additional number of community health aids, primarily for COVID. Uh, we are now actively recruiting and training those community health aids. They will become a critical part of the health extension at the community level to provide critical educational and other coordinating support for any disaster and hurricane during this season um, clearly would be one of the areas that we would have uh, trained them in. So that's it for now, uh, unless there are, other, there are questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Tufton. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to all the pre presenters. Uh, for you know, making their presentation and ensuring and reassuring too uh, those at the council meeting and those who are watching online of the state of preparedness uh, for Jamaica for the upcoming hurricane season. And so as I promised, the prime minister who essentially is the chairman of our proceedings at this point uh, will uh, preside over just a few questions. Uh, it is a 12.31. We've been here for about an hour and 15 minutes, so I'd encourage... For those who have questions or comments for the Prime Minister, we have several partners, including the National Solid Waste Management Authority, the National Water Commission, the Telecoms Partners, and several others who are on the Zoom. May I encourage you to use the raise hand feature. Once you raise your hand, I'll acknowledge you, and you may be able to make a quick comment or uh, ask a, a quick question if we could have all those on the Zoom for us. Uh, so we'll certainly be able to take uh, any response from you, any comment or question at this point. I believe we also have uh, some members of the media who are also joining us. This is also your time to be able to ask a question or two if you do have any. Mr. Prime Minister, if you want to as well speak. No, it appears not to be any question, so we could move on to... I believe there are about 40 uh, or so persons on our Zoom at this point. 
Uh, yes, and Minister Favel Williams, of course, has joined us as well. Well, let me thank everyone who has joined us. Let me thank everyone who has joined us. And I, I'll make one observation. I'm certain that there are 40 less vehicles on the road moving between the office of the Prime Minister and your respective offices. Uh, we would have saved um, several hundred gallons of diesel or, or gas or gasoline and um, the carbon footprint would have been lessened, the stress would have been lessened, and we managed to accomplish what we set out to do, which is to mobilize the national disaster apparatus to be prepared for the hurricane season. And possibly, we would have gotten our message across to many more persons in a far more comfortable and relaxed atmosphere than if we were all gathered somewhere, uh, um, maybe here or somewhere else, we would have had to use a much bigger space. So this meeting is an example of working smarter and working safer. The Jamaican economy can return to full productive capacity using the technology and using the flexible arrangements that are provided for in law. And uh, that will be my mantra going forward to ensure that we reconfigure our economy and our society to be more efficient, working smarter and working safer. Um, since I have avoided questions and there were no protests about that, I will go into my closing remarks, which would be, I'm happy to hear that all the lead agencies in the response are ready. We, we would not expect anything else to be said. I take particular note of the NWA, who has said, they have said they are ready. Now, the reason why I'm taking particular note is that <clears throat> for all intents and purposes, I am the minister responsible for the NWA. Um, minister Everett Warmington um, handles it directly for me, but I still pay very close attention, particularly to policy and budget and the large legacy projects that the NWA is responsible for. So I do happen to know that the NWA has been impacted by the economic crisis that has been caused by the pandemic. Nevertheless, this will in no way imperil the response that we would expect from the NWA, certainly in preparing for the season. So I do know that the program of routine maintenance is ongoing, that we will be ensuring that the drains are cleared and, you know, the public, because it would affect them directly uh, even outside of a hurricane season, would complain about block drains and gullies. But there is a particularly important reason why we must clear the drains. During the last threat of a hurricane that we had, which would have been Hurricane Matthew, I happened to be on the road and we experienced some of the heavy downpours. And the road on which I was driving was flooded. And I could see the reason for the flooding was that water was trying to percolate through the, the drains, but they were blocked. They were blocked by plastics. They were blocked by other kinds of debris, which they didn't just materialize. It is our behavior as citizens and our deficiencies in waste management as well in, in, from a government perspective that would have caused this. So, in my closing remarks, I would want to encourage citizens to take greater effort in disposing of your plastic wastes in particular, because they end up creating blockages, and those blockages end up um, creating the flooding that occurs during um, heavy downpours. 
But I know that our routine maintenance program will kick in shortly, and uh, the members of parliament and uh, the local representatives will play a critical role in ensuring that drains are cleared and gullies are cleared just before the season begins. The NWA is always maintaining its list of service providers, contractors, who would have to be called upon in the event of a disaster to have heavy equipment ready to clear landslides and roadblocks. So that list, I'm sure, Vard, and that list is, is ready, that you are in contact with them. They, they understand that their equipment should be ready just in case of any eventualities. The permanent secretary in the Ministry of Labor and Social Security, that ministry has been doing an excellent job in providing relief to the vulnerable. The COVID pandemic has forced the government really to pay close attention to the systems of delivery. Because in any time of crisis, which requires the distribution of a scarce benefit, uh, and sometimes uh, this benefit uh, could, be a, could be food, as we have had to do in the COVID pandemic. Just merely going into a community with, uh, with truckloads of goods does not mean that the needy will get it. Sometimes the greedy will take it, and the needy won't get it. So it is not necessarily always about the storage capacity that you have and the stock that you have. That's one part of it. The other part of it is how to ensure that you get the benefit to the needy. And you are not just able to identify the needy, but you are also able to identify who are the greedy ones, who are coming back three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, while some people don't get once. So the delivery systems are very important. You, you need to be able to identify people. So we have to spend a little bit more time working on that. We have started to work on um, a, a database system that would capture persons, and then you would be able to identify them and ensure that they get a benefit. Um, so we will spend a little bit more time, PS, working on that system. And I also heard your plea, and I will pass this on to the Minister of Finance, that you need more resources. I'm certain you will have to negotiate with the Ministry of Health because uh, they are first in line <laughs> for, the, for the new resources that have to be put into the, the, the supplementary or the redistributed resources that have to be placed in the supplementary. But yes, we will have to make even further provisions because whatever stock you had, those stocks would have been depleted in serving during the pandemic response. Um, I'm happy to know that um, our emergency response in fire, um, in the fire brigade, that, that response is ready. Very important, very important. And uh, of course, the presentation from the Minister of Health, uh, always um, well-structured presentations, um, which clearly outlines your priorities. And uh, normally, heading into a hurricane season, the Ministry of Health would always be a, an agency, a, a ministry, that um, is a zero-fail activity. I mean, they must be up. But now, going into the hurricane season and having to deal with a pandemic. And, you know, sometimes we forget, and I'm happy that you mentioned it, Chris, that we are still treating with dengue. That, you know, the public may be of the view that all the Ministry of Health is doing, or maybe even the entire government, is dealing with COVID. That is not the case. We're still dealing with all the other illnesses that were there before the pandemic. And therefore, whilst we have, in many instances, redirected and diverted resources 
to contain and manage the COVID pandemic. We can't do it forever. So we will have to transition how we manage. Uh, we have to rethink the business process behind much of what we're doing because life goes on. And even though we are doing well in managing COVID, there might be other areas that by virtue of the diversion and redirection, we take our eyes off them and then they become a problem. And that can't be the way in which we manage forever. So in managing the pandemic and getting on top of it and putting in place the systems that will be sustainable and in a contract with the public, meaning that the public agrees to be faithful and consistent in observing the orders and the protocols that are in place. That will allow us to then redirect our resources back to the other issues that may become challenging as we move through this period of pandemic and potential um, natural disasters. So it's a lot to do with limited resources. I want the country to know that all of what we're saying here and all of, what, all of what we're doing, there is no new money sitting down somewhere that we can just reach into and take up. We, are, we will have to manage with less resources. We will have to do more with less. So let us not, therefore, be irresponsible as a government or as an individual to do anything that could create an avoidable disaster. So as we, even as we return the economy to full productivity, we have to look very carefully on how we do that. Even as we plan for the hurricane season, we have to look very carefully on how we do that. And all our activities must be towards a productive end. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, Jamaicans, um, those of you joining us virtually, I believe that the charge is very clear. I believe the insight into our strategic positioning and response is very clear. And I have great confidence in the team assembled that we will all do our part in ensuring that we continue to manage the pandemic and be well prepared for any eventualities in the upcoming hurricane season. God bless you and God bless Jamaica. That concludes our meeting of the National Disaster Risk Management Council chaired by Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you at another point when we have another meeting and certainly stream it live here on your favorite platforms. Have a good afternoon, everyone.